Hello and welcome. Today is day two of the UN 2023 Water Conference. I'm Shakuntala Santharan, Shaks for short, and uh, I'm here at the SDG studio at UN headquarters in New York. We begin today with the perspective of cities on the challenges that we face. We'll be finding out how global cities are coping with water-related climate hazards. We'll be hearing some real-life experiences and showcasing innovative, uh, sustainable uh, climate-based uh, solutions. And I am delighted to join, to be joined today by uh, Mayor Ahmed Abu Talib, Mayor of Rotterdam from the Netherlands, yes. uh, Mayor Kate Gallego, who is uh, from Phoenix, Arizona, here in the United States. Uh, we have HP Nanda, who is Group Executive, uh, rather Group Executive Vice President, and CEO of water utility at the Danish company Grundfos, which is the world's largest manufacturer of pumps. And Rebecca Ilunga, who is head of adaptation research for C40 Cities, which is a network of mayors of nearly 100 cities collaborating to deliver the urgent action needed uh, to confront the climate crisis. And both Rotterdam and Phoenix are part of C40. Thank you all very much uh, for being here. We're going to dive into our conversation shortly. First, let's take a look at this. From water scarcity to flooding, cities around the world are facing the devastating impacts of the climate crisis. Water is vital for our cities and these threats cannot be ignored. Mayors are taking bold action to address these challenges and make cities more resilient. They're leading the way with innovative solutions that save lives and protect our communities. Now it's up to all of us to join the effort. We need to work together to tackle these challenges and build a future where our cities are more sustainable, equitable and resilient. Together we can make a real difference. We can create a world where water is not a source of danger but a source of life and opportunity for all. Let's be united in action to build a brighter future for our cities and our planet. So cities worldwide, as we know, are facing increasing severe uh, flooding and drought as the climate crisis worsens, uh, which is uh, threatening uh, economic stability, infrastructure and uh, public health cities more cities are starting to acknowledge, recognize that urgent action is needed. Otherwise, this will get worse and exacerbate already existing social and environmental inequalities. So if I could uh, start with you, Mayor Abutalab, you've been mayor of Rotterdam since 2009. What are some of the uh, water challenges that your city is facing? Because Rotterdam, of course, is a large part below sea level. Yeah. Um, Eastern part of Rotterdam is minus six meters. That the, the 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 airport is minus four. So it's a, uh, a very critical uh, thing. Well, the, the most important investment that we did last year is, is to prevent flooding in downtown Rotterdam. Uh, for that reason, we um, uh, we have been uh, stupid as a city to finance outside the borders of the city a huge project, an Olympic um, uh, rowing lane for sports, but it's for the city, a water storage system. Ah. It's outside the city, so we, and we finance it, as stupid as we are, but we did. Um, we built water plazas in the city, um, a plazas that serve as playground for kids and families and gatherings to play basketball, but when it's a lot of rain, then it serves as basin to capture water. And if the water freezes, you may skate. So a combination of a lot of functions. We have also uh, storage systems under the, underneath the garages where we collect the water uh, when there is a lot of uh, rainfall. So it's a combination of a lot of things in combination with creating green spaces. Um. So let me jump in first, Mayor Abutalib. Mm. That, those are some of the very innovative yeah. solutions that you're talking about. But just talk us through what are the challenges? How bad is it? Has it become worse? Because like here in, in New York, we didn't have snow and we saw snow in Southern California. Yeah. Is that 
What's we, happening? We had, we had a bad experience in 1953, um, a big flood in the Netherlands, a, a lot of casualties and a lot of uh, um, dead animals in the southern part of the Netherlands, even to, uh, to the borders of the, of, the, of the city. And nowadays we see uh, periods of heavy rain um, that then the city and the, 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 the surrounding regions are then in, in, in danger. A, sh a lot of rain in short times that even the existing sewer system cannot cope with it. Um, and then we have also sometimes a short, a short term of six, eight weeks of drought. That is for us a big peak period, uh, six up to eight weeks, no, no rain. Then the river level sinks to um, a degree that the barges that connect the port with Germany cannot uh, serve Germany with raw materials for the industry and the gasoline and everything. So it can, has a, uh, can have a, a very um, big economic impact, on, not only on the city, but on the economy of Europe. So yeah, th these are new developments and we have to cope with it. Yes, the weather patterns all over the changing. place are changing. Yeah. What about in, in Phoenix, uh, Mayor Gallego? I, are they the opposite of Rotterdam? Because Phoenix is located in a desert, but like we said, the weather patterns are changing. Absolutely, so it's, it's very rare for us to have the challenges that Rotterdam has with too much water. For us, we are a desert city, so we really focus on scarcity and managing the limited resources that we have, although uh, we have had terrible flooding in the city, so we are getting less and less rain, but it often comes in more intense spurts. Uh, but similar to Rotterdam, we have made investments around the city. Uh, one of the things C40 helps us with is that nature-based solutions can be very important to having a more resilient ecosystem. So the uh, city of Phoenix has been investing in forests uh, to the north in our watershed that serves the city of Phoenix, and we have partnered with our federal government and nonprofit community to have a healthier forest, which tends to get us a stronger water supply with less contamination in it, and that's been very, very successful. Uh, we also are trying to work with partners in the private sector to make sure we have the very best analytics in our system. Uh, we recently pa partnered with an Israeli company that had very advanced sensors, so the second there's a contaminant in the water, we're much more likely to know and to be able to address it. Uh, Grunfuss has the ability to help us predict leaks and prevent them, and so we want to be as good as stewards as possible. So we're going from the very most high-tech to really going back to nature-based solutions. The city of Phoenix gets its name from the mythical bird that rose from the ashes. Yes. In our case, our founders were speaking of the, the um, indigenous community that predated Phoenix. They built a very robust system of canals to move water with just gravity. Uh, they hand dug it with just, uh, we think, sticks, and it, it created a whole valley that was agriculture driven. Our modern day European founders then went back and redug those same canals. It was great collaboration around water that really allowed Phoenix to become a city. And so, because that is so much of our roots and that collaboration, it, it gives me great hope that we can do more great things around water. We are going to look uh, more at collaboration a little bit later in our conversation. First, R Rebecca, um, you're from Cape Town, South yeah. Africa. You're no stranger to drought, Not to, at all. to water. Day, day, day zero. Day zero was yeah. our narrative. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so, so uh, you've also been working uh, with the C40 for years. You've worked with many cities. Uh, over the, the climate crisis. Um, and, and there's new research, I understand, about the potential impact of climate hazards on cities. Definitely. So in the past couple of years, um, with support from the Grand Fuss Foundation, we conducted research looking at what flooding and drought hazards might look like in our C40 cities um, towards 2050. And so from a flooding perspective, specifically riverine flooding, we're looking at about 7.4 million people that are going to be impacted in C40 cities. And then from a drought perspective, we're looking at water losses up to 16 billion meters cubed per annum. So, I mean, to put that in perspective, that's the Sydney Harbour drying out 30 times over in the period of a year. So it's no small issue that we're really trying to deal with here. 
But I think as our mayors have also spoken to, although these impacts look towards 2050, some cities are already experiencing these impacts right now. And they're not just experiencing only flooding or only drought, it's really compounding effects. And water as a system is really gonna also impact other social systems and economic systems as Mayor Abu Taleb suggested. So whether it's health or whether it's energy, you know, the water system as a whole really is intricate to a whole bunch of sectors as well. It certainly is. Everything is linked uh, to water in one way or another. HP, please tell us, what are some of the major obstacles that cities face in uh, adapting to water-related uh, climate hazards? Thank you. Uh, what a momentous day today. In 1989, because we are in the United Nations building today, was the day the climate change panel was formed in the United Nations. So that means we have been talking for 34 years about climate change and impacts of climate change. And in one simple way, for me, climate crisis is a water crisis. And water is fundamental to life. And uh, I think both the mayors spoke about how do we create an integrated water management that means solving all the challenges at the same time, making the cities beautiful with parks and playgrounds to improve the quality of life for the citizens, to ensure we are able to handle the water during drought or flood. So you have to have the storage and discharge functionality, resiliency, flexibility at the same time, and then making really progress towards decarbonization because we know it's a long-term train, decarbonize while doing this. Those, all the three, you feel like, they are challenges. The traditional approach could be we handle each of them separately, mm. but I don't think that's the approach. And the approach is going to be integrated water management. That means really look at all these three conflicting, sometimes they may look conflicting, but they can be much more interdependent, much more interlinked, and can be solved in the same way if we do what is called systems level thinking, look at the whole system and bring all the ecosystem partners together and uh, that could really help us. To no, what, I, what I would like to add to, to this, um, what I learned from managing the crisis of COVID, I was one of the 25 regional mayors in the Netherlands together with the delegation of the government to manage the COVID in the Netherlands. What I learned is that uh, if there is a crisis, you cannot tackle it using existing laws and legislation. That means that you have to work beyond that. So if we consider that we're talking about a crisis when it comes to water, and that's my definition, we have a crisis. Mm -hmm. 800 million people in the world have no access. A lot of um, um, uh, neighborhoods in cities, settlements that are not regulated. Uh, we heard this morning the issue of Istanbul, where a lot of people are coming to Turkey and Istanbul to try to make a living um, uh, in places that are not regulated, no special planning, no sewage, no water. Um, Sao Paulo in, in Brazil, um, um, similar issue. If we consider that it is a crisis, then we have to acknowledge that the existing way of dealing with city management are not good enough. It isn't working. So we have to design something different. And that's the issue. So I, I will be really... Um, 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 interested in the coming years, although through the United Nations or C40 or whatever, to learn from each other. Uh, if it is a crisis, what then? How we have to deal with it? Um, if the drought in, in, uh, in your city, in Phoenix, will endure for a long time, what? Um, there have been cities in the world where um, um, water systems have been um, connected to um, sea-going vessels to bring water from other places to still have a couple of hours of war in the city. It's a crisis, existing laws are not working, what? What next, Yeah. right? So some cities like both of yours are coming up with innovative solutions, nature-based solutions. Uh, and uh, we have an example here in New York uh, with its coastal protection plan, I was talking about it earlier, uh, to prevent flooding. And the Netherlands has played a key role in flood mitigation here in New York. His Majesty King Willem Alexander of the Netherlands uh, was here, uh, is here right now for this water conference. And he went on a tour of the project. Our reporter, Haja Jacobi, was there. Check this out. 
Now we are currently here at the East Side River in Lower Manhattan in New York City where there is a special visit from the King of the Netherlands together with the minister and other water experts. If you look on this side, you can see the water. And if you look on that side, you can see these big, massive walls. These are floodgates that have been designed and built in cooperation with Dutch companies together here in New York City. Now this spot is a prime location of how the Netherlands is working together with New York City on water management. That being said, back to you, Shucks. Great stuff, Haja. Now, we have other examples of innovative uh, solutions, including in Mexico City, they have a rainwater capture system that's helping them better manage uh, their water resources. And then there's Rotterdam with its floating parks and homes, and there's even a floating farm. Right. I was very amazed when I, I saw these cows floating. Uh, on this platform. Please tell us more about these innovative solutions. Rotterdam has a climate adaptation strategy, doesn't yeah. it? And we have an, um, um, donated to the United Nations a building that is also floating. Um, uh, that's a, an office building with, combined with a restaurant and so on. So w welcome to see it. Um, the idea is, uh, uh, that, that's why I disagree with the comments uh, in the beginning of our meeting. Uh, someone says that um, uh, we have to stop the danger that is caused by water humani for humanity. It's really stupid to think that you can win from Mother Nature. Mm. We cannot win from Mother Nature. So the, at most, we can, what we can do is uh, try to live with, the, with Mother Nature. Uh, we cannot predict the effects of, of, of such an event. So the, um, trying to um, think about our, if, if the water um, that can rise two meters or three meters. What if you built houses that can move with the level of the water um, and to generate its own energy? That building that we donated to the United Nations is generating its own energy for full 100%. Solar power? Or? We use the water, yeah. We use the water from, from the river for cooling, but also for heating. Mm. It's sustaining in itself. It's a kind of a, a microcosmos. That's an experiment, how to, to deal with, with that type of, uh, of phenomenon. Um, the water plazas uh, in neighborhoods to collect the water. Uh, but if there is no rain, then it's playground. So double use of, of, of space is, is there. Garages, uh, underneath you may collect water. D downtown Rotterdam, we have two of these systems. Um, huge garages. You're talking about the, the yeah, pool. Yeah, yeah. When, it, when it, it's filled with, with water, that's good enough um, to prevent flooding downtown, which was usual. And now, the, uh, now there's no flooding. I'm mayor now for 15 years, and I would never experienced any of this flooding in downtown last uh, last 15 years. And the, when the, 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 the rain is, is over, then we pump the water to the river uh, in a very ordinary manner. So technology can help us really solve issues, but also to to make double use of, of land. Um, all this pavement on the streets, you may make them porous in a way that the water can get into the ground instead of to let the water to the, uh, to the uh, um, uh, sewer system. Um, and also to build more, you see the pictures, to see more, to build more green, space, green spaces in the city um, in collaboration with citizens. The Mandela Park in the southern part of Rotterdam will be in a part of the, of the port, uh, an old part of the port uh, that will be um, the, the used by citizens to build, to build a park in it. Seven of these major green projects, also to reduce heat stress downtown the city. So yes, you, you can do a lot with smart design, but cities, and that's also another question, to what degree you want cities to grow? Not the question to my city, but it's a question for New York, for Istanbul, for Jakarta for um, Sao Paulo, to what degree do you want to grow? And that's also a policy issue. That means people are coming there because these centers are magnets for the economy. People want to make a living. Why are they coming there? That's a very important question because they don't see other chances elsewhere in the country. So that must be, re we have to rethink the way we concentrate people at one location because then it's a big issue for managing the scarce resources to bring all these resources to one location. Um, uh, 
the, the a city like Sao Paulo, in my opinion, that city cannot continue to grow. It's, there is a limit to what degree cities um, can strive towards and growing and growing and growing. And that will not be the solution for cities in the future. Can I make a comment, compliment? Please, So HP. I met, uh, we met, uh, when we were together, we met the mayor of Dhaka. He has 2,000 people coming to Dhaka every single day. So what does that mean? There will 2, be 2,000 new people coming New in. people coming to the yes. city. What about no. Mumbai? In Mumbai, uh, um, all the big cities. And if you look at the, at the end of the century, Lagos will be the most populated city in the world. And today, it is not in the top 20. So to mayor's comment, so urbanization, this, the speed at which urbanization is happening, primarily in the global south and different parts of the world, and how do you really keep up with water supply, infrastructure, public health, hygiene, sanitation? That's a big challenge. Yeah. And I don't think the incremental way of problem solving is going to get us there. Whether you have to really think about if we either have policy level, how to prevent some of this migration of people to urban in, or really think about future back. Yeah. Imagining Lagos will have maybe 80 million people in 2100 and work backwards. What sort of infrastructure we build? What sort of ecosystem yeah. we build? And it has, that brings another issue with it, that if all these farmers are leaving the countryside and going to cities, in the future we will lack hands to produce food. Mm -hmm. Farming is not in cities. Farming is, happens elsewhere. So this domestic, um, uh, domestic uh, movement of this huge group of people, really we have to, um, to make living in countryside also attractive enough with uh, schooling and housing and uh, hospitals and whatever uh, um, and, and uh, to solve other issues that make living there more convenient to uh, prevent migration to, uh, to cities. We need these hands to, to produce our food. Right. But I really see it as an opportunity as well. I think cities are really stepping up and showing that they have the platform for innovation and to really take ownership of water and how they take care of both nature and the people that live within a city space. So as much as I agree, cities like Lagos and Mumbai are going to grow exponentially. It's really an opportunity for mayors as well to think, well, how do we really tackle these issues in a way that is harmonious with both the people that live within the city and nature? Really good point, Rebecca, because the cities already are there. They exist. They are facing all these issues and, and Phoenix is a big city and is growing. What kind of solutions is Phoenix looking at? You were talking a, a, a bit uh, about it earlier about forest, planting forests. Please tell us more about your solutions. So we were looking at the health of the forest in our watershed that supplies our water. We're also questioning whether agriculture has to be a rural enterprise. So we have learned that urban agriculture tends to use less water. Um, we have. Unfortunately, as the economy has transitioned post-COVID, we have retail spaces, particularly some big box stores that uh, are no longer needed for their original purpose. And we're looking at whether those can become agricultural hubs. We're also having real conversations about whether we can't start disclosing how much water goes into your food. We make decisions on our purchases based on a variety of factors. You, today, you can look at your coffee and decide what were the labor standards on which it was grown. Mm -hmm. But that information is not as available on water, and we think that consumers want to know that and might make different decisions. So we are trying to financially support urban agriculture and make sure we have the great technology. Uh, the good news for all of us as consumers, if the food is grown nearby, it will arrive fresher and taste better in addition to being... Yeah. But that's not a solution for a city like uh, Shanghai with 25 million people, as easy as it is. But they could grow. I support uh, urban farming, and we do that, and I support that. It's uh, still a, a very low-scale type of, uh, of, of uh, solutions. And I have been visiting um, a vertical farming in Singapore, also a good idea. Yes. But that will not serve cities of millions. That's the issue. I think that's the beauty of it, perhaps, though, that all of these problems need to be solved locally. Yeah. So we're thinking globally, but we're really acting local. So Phoenix has found a solution that works for their context. And with C40, we've really found that when you work with cities, as much as they can share their solutions mm -hmm. and there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer engagement, cities really need to deal with those issues on the ground. Can you share with us, Rebecca, some of the high impact uh, solutions that some other cities are uh, putting in place? 
Definitely. So, I mean, we really, when we're speaking about water, there's four key areas from a hazard-specific standpoint that we really see cities taking action in. So we're looking at sustainable urban drainage systems when it comes to flooding issues. So we've seen the city of Wuhan implementing a sponge city, which is very innovative for its time, but also dates back to the past and how nature naturally used to take care of a space. Um, Rotterdam with their um, sea level management, I think that's a feat of nature in itself and really how they've used technology to protect their people and think towards the future. But then also coming back to the Phoenix example, you know, they've dealt with a lot of drought and we've really seen how they're looking at alternative water solutions. So whether it's reuse, whether it's kind of looking at what options are there to work better with their groundwater to minimize the impacts of drought within their city. But then there's also the conservation piece. So really thinking about the people on the ground and what role do they have to play in terms of being stewards of this resource? So how do we teach people and educate people around saving water? So vital. I have been wanting to get at this, uh, you know, it's so, it sounds so simple, right? But education is key. I'm from Singapore, where I was taught as a child to conserve water. I can hear my mother in my head going, turn the tap off. Don't run the tap when you're brushing your teeth. Use a cup of water. What did you say? I did it. I was, I, you know, it was drummed into me. We had a save water campaign in Singapore. I don't think they have any more, but, you know, it's a water scarce a country and uh, you know so that was something that was inbred into me so even now when I see people running the tap you know and we were talking about this just now HP about how to get your water hot so now when I want to get my water hot I have to run the tap for like five minutes you know especially now it's, it's you know cold uh, there are simple solutions though right you yeah. Gunfrost makes pumps yeah so you know in Europe extensively every home has the hot water circulation where you open the tap in nanosecond you get hot water. We don't have that in the US. And how do you really change that behavior? Because historically we did not have the same sense of urgency about water scarcity in the USA like other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So it is more about finding our education and awareness. For individual homes we can do it. Industries, the concept is going to be you can truly have zero water industries of the world of the future. What does that mean? You take water once, it is circulating your process back and forth, back and forth. All the technologies today exist. And if you go to L'Oreal, the cosmetics company, they talk about dry factories. They're already thinking about that. You can do that for industry. And to Mayor's comment, precision agriculture, to Rebecca's point, precision agriculture, whether it is vertical farming, but with IoT sensors, to dramatically reduce the consumption of water, sensing the moisture level in the soil. Precision agriculture is a big emerging field and I have a lot of belief today agriculture consumes the highest amount of water in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you can optimize individual homes, you can optimize industry, you can optimize agriculture, we can solve water scarcity in our yeah. lifetime. I, I believe in that. I'm, I'm, I'm staying in a hotel now in New York here. It takes five minutes in the morning to get hot water. Right. It's really stupid and I spend a lot of water and, and, and I don't feel good about that. Um, I'm home, um, I have a, a clock in the shower, three minutes. Uh, three minutes is enough to have a shower. And I used, when I was a kid, um, I'm born in Morocco, Northern Africa, with um, um, a big water problem. Once I s stayed in a hotel, a very small hotel at the Atlantic Ocean, and there was no water that day. And the hotel manager distributed per person three liters of water, bottled water, um, for, for, for shower. For the day. I can tell you it's possible to have a shower, including shampoo in your hair, mm -hmm. with three liters of water. Um, I have been experimenting that. So indeed, technology as you produce and other companies can help us enough to, um, to um, uh, reduce the consumption of water. It is possible. It is possible, yeah. yes. So, so we uh, have heard some really you know, great ideas and some innovations out there, but it's important to have scale, yeah. right? To get it out there. So how do we get these solutions out there at scale? First, HP. Thank you. What do you think? So uh, I'll, I just want to give you one example about uh, the previous one and talk about scale. Water industry generally has the image, it's a very risk averse conservative industry. Any technology, any new adoption takes long time, 20 years, 30 years from the start to maturity of any technology 
uh, easily 20, 30 years. So the only way is we have all the technologies in the world, all the solutions in the world. So that means we have to scale is accelerate the implementation so that we can quickly solve the crisis. Mm -hmm. And for me, uh, it's all about moving ourselves to the right hand side of the emotional change curve. We have probably crossed as a society from denial, awareness, to acceptance of climate crisis, hopefully in the last 35 years. And now it is more about just action. And action means experimentation, because Rebecca made a comment, technology is global, but solutions has to be local. Mm -hmm. Water is very local. Water will work in Rotterdam, may not work in Phoenix. So really figuring it out, how do we do quick experimentation to inspire confidence for the solutions locally? and then go to solution to broad-based applications, and then embed integration, embed this integrated water management to the way we think about business planning. I think you now cities like Rotterdam, what does that mean? Means They have been able to think about storage of water to the citizenship, uh, living standards, health and hygiene, and decarbonization, everything together. I think getting everybody as quickly as you can to that place globally through rapid acceleration will be helpful. Yeah, you know, citizens are, are um, um, interested when you come with water uh, solutions in, in neighborhoods. Probably not, but they are interested when you show to them that what you are doing is also touching to social issues. Yeah. yeah. To, to their own living standards, to their own conditions, uh, changing the living environment. It's, it's greener, it's, it's, um, it's better to live, it's good for kids. And, then things become attractive, then you get more engagement than when you come and say, hmm. I, I remember um, a long time ago, I had a, a meeting with elderly in, in a nursing home and I told them, you are living in a very unsafe environment. And they said, what? We don't expect any shooting here. Said, no, it's not shooting, it's minus six. You are living under the sea level with six meters. Uh -huh. But that was not, they were not aware that there's an issue. That was not an issue for them. That's what they grew up with. Yeah, so shooting is an issue. But um, minus six meters is not an issue. And that's not something you can change. You have to adapt yeah. to it. You yeah. have to adapt to it. Yeah. So, uh, Kate, you were talking about, so we are hearing collaboration, working together is vital. We got to work together to move forward. That's one of the key uh, principles at this conference, uh, cross-sectoral uh, uh, work, right? So. Um, you were talking about working with the private sector. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about that collaboration. One of the things we've learned is that the city can pilot new technologies and then bring it to scale with the private sector. So Phoenix operates Sky Harbor Airport. We looked at our cooling costs for the airport and were able to make changes to our cooling towers that sell, uh, save 20 million gallons per year as well as significant chemical costs. And that makes sense for businesses on the economic level as well as the social level. So we've now created a blue bank that can help finance those projects in the private sector and bring them to scale, which is incredible. Uh, we may have a little bit of a different political environment than Rotterdam. Our voters are very focused on water. So we had city council elections this month and in polling in one district, the number one issue for the entire community was water. So we are really focused on water and that helps give us the political will to do more difficult things and, and to work together. We've also seen associated with that more interest in green jobs and that's a focus for C40. We have launched an initiative for 50 million green jobs by 2030 and we wanna make sure that we have the right professionals who can work at the city of Phoenix or work at private sector companies and that really helps us bring it to scale and those jobs can vary from engineers and advanced consulting to working in, to make the agricultural system more efficient. So we're very proud of C40's work in that area. And we think it just really proves cities are where it gets done. Whether it be water or climate change, cities come together and lead. We have a variety of different solutions and, and we've been on the forefront. The same is true on climate change where we convened in Glasgow as cities and had more than a thousand that committed to net zero. Many cities are ahead of our goals. That is not as much true for national governments, mm -hmm. but really C40 is, is proof 
that cities are where we are solving these tough challenges. So down to the local level, like exactly, you said, right? So Rebecca, uh, C40 has research on some best practices uh, for cities who want to work with stakeholders outside local government. Please tell us about that. Definitely. So I think we really think of this as what are the determinants for water action? So what do all city governments need to be thinking about if they're thinking of green jobs, if they're thinking about technology? And there's five core building blocks that really come in. The one is really much around data and information. We can't make a decision. You can't change what you can't measure. And then the second area is really around engagement. So how do we educate people? How do we bring them on board? How do we ensure that we have all the stakeholders that we need at the table. Thirdly is governance. So Mayor Gallego spoke to cities being at the forefront, but that needs leadership and that needs effective governance in place and what are the policies that cities are looking to implement. And then fourth, which I know everyone speaks about, but that's funding and finance. Can any of this be done without the money aspect? Um, and then lastly, really, once we've implemented a solution, how are we really going about measuring and monitoring and ensuring that whatever has been put in place isn't temporary, that we're really looking to make it long term and that people and cities are ensuring that what has been placed there can be a solution that our next generations can really benefit from as well. So those are really five key building blocks that we're seeing cities implement at various scales when it comes to water. Mayor Abu Talib, how closely is Rotterdam working with the private sector? Well, we work with the private sector. We have um, some big companies that are operating globally, based in Rotterdam, uh, dealing with, with water, water management, building ports, um, dredging and building windmills in the ocean, family companies like Fanort, uh, Arcadas. Um, but I believe also in collaborating with universities. Um, the uh, Technical University of Delft is, uh, has a, a, a fascinating department dealing with water. So we try also to, <coughs> to work together with all these parties to improve our, our technology. And we're open for all type of solutions, whether they are coming from the market or they're coming from, from the public institutions. The only thing that I would I don't not accept that is having commercial parties in the heart of uh, distributing water. And that must be my opinion always an issue for governments and a public issue, not a, a commercial thing. So we will not pro privatize our water, our water system. Mm -hmm. But collaborating with commercial parties and public institutions like universities is key to reach really um, new standards. HP, how can the private sector work with cities? You were talking about this ambitious project that Grundfos has to get uh, clean drinkable water to, was it 300 million people? And you're working with the C40 on this. Where are you planning to get this uh, water to people and how? Yeah, thank you. So I think the, the mayor of Rotterdam spoke about 800 million people not having water every day. Yes. So a lot of our focus for giving clean water access to 300 million people is to those people who don't have access today. Because you know, we are a foundation owned company. For us, profit is a means to the goal. It is not a goal in itself. So we really feel like doing good and really well for the society is uh, essential for us as a corporate citizen. So a lot of work up hours is in Africa, in India, in Pakistan. I was in India just a month ago. Our solar powered pump gave water to a family in the northern part of Kashmir in India after 80 years yeah. at their pump functions with solar energy in a negative 30 degrees C, minus 30 degrees C, and the family could get water. So think about the value of their smile. It is priceless. No money can buy that. Mm -hmm. So I think that is the societal side. And on the working with the cities on uh, solving the climate resiliency, I strongly believe that we have a work still to do between cities and the private sector. You look at the language we use, I would say probably Kate is my customer or Mayor of Rotterdam is my customer. But you know, it, when you have this transactional relationship, you can never solve the critical problems together. You have to go beyond transactional to truly understand what keeps them awake at night, mm -hmm. what problems they want to solve, what is the outcome they want. Technology, products, these are means to the end, they're not the end in itself. Yeah. So how do we really go and understand the outcomes they want to solve? And in the process, how do I improve our relationship from transactional to be more like a thought partner, to be a problem solver, and that is really the collaboration that you are talking about. The collaboration really needs problem solving, bringing in unique competencies from both sides of the house, like the example of the Phoenix Airport. You know, 
the private sector individual companies have a unique DNA for problem solving and the cities need it sit down together really understand yeah. and then solve it together. But I say a few words about financing yes uh, you brought in the issue of financing yes. and um, vital and there's not enough yeah um, I, do, I dare well it's not enough for it's, water related investment no and, um, I, and even that's not correct I think it's a matter of making choices uh, I am born in Africa and I'm really really keen on the future of that continent the poorest continent in the world um, there is Objectively, when you look from a very far distance, you may say, mm, poor, less money. That's a continent with a huge number of wars. Mm -hmm. Wars, where they spend a huge amount of money uh, for the army, for buying ammunition, um, uh, etc. If you succeed in making another choice, on spending a fraction of that money for bringing water to the farmers and the, the poor ones in villages, uh, it's another decision. Um, I, I dare to say that because I have the authority to say that. I'm an African. Um, probably the other ones will say, mm, it's difficult to criticize a continent. But I, I dare to say that. I'm born there, and, and uh, I have the authority to say that, and I think it's a matter of making choices with the same amount of money yes. that we have. Yes, we're actually going to be looking at that issue in our third uh, show today uh, about moving money from other sectors towards water, choices. which we need, exactly. Yeah. We choices. mayors, we make choices every day. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're talking about collaboration, mm -hmm. Mayor Gallego. How is uh, Phoenix, is Phoenix collaborating with other cities? And, and what do you think they can learn from Phoenix's experience? Mm -hmm. One of our great collaborations is with the 50L Coalition, which gets its name from the amount of water that Cape Town residents used on a daily basis. The 50L Coalition is likely to announce a, a very exciting partnership with C40 soon. It takes a lot of the international institutions as well as private sector partners such as P&G and IKEA together to look at how we can design better. And it's everything from leak detection. So in our multifamily residence in Phoenix, we think the biggest use of water, wasted water is unfortunately toilet leaks. And so how can we detect and address that with low cost solutions. But we also look at how do you just make sustainability irresistible and design products that will be easy to sell to people who are not as focused on water conservation, including making it easier to do dishes with less water. Um, separately from the 50L Coalition, we have partnerships with the private sector and our federal government on how to design communities in a way that is much smarter. So the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States has a water scent standard that really looks at how you design new communities with water at the forefront. And we have partnered with uh, communities like Verdun in Phoenix where they're gonna implement water scents in all of their buildings and also working with the National Wildlife Federation to design nature-based landscaping, which is using a lot of open space but not irrigating, really trying to plant native plants and create much healthier development. And that has been a great way to bring these innovations yeah. to scale, which is very exciting. We've also had good financial partnerships. So we have funded water investments with green bonds, uh, a little bit of a risk. We did our first one in March of 2020 when the yeah. markets were so uncertain around COVID-19. And it was oversubscribed multiple times. The private sector wanted to come to the table to help us with water and sustainability. And there are investors who are more interested in the bonds because of that green designation. So we need more products, uh, ideas like that. Rebecca, uh, how do we accelerate these solutions and, and moving us away from the crisis and, and making progress? How can cities best work together? Definitely. I mean, I think a lot of it has been said from a collaboration perspective. It's really how we collaborating horizontally in cities, so across sectors, but as Mayor Kate Gallego said, also vertically, so with national governments and cities, because although cities are at the forefront, their mandate only goes so far sometimes when it comes to water resources. Then there's the partnership piece around the private sector, but also other cities partnering with one another. 
Thirdly is the innovation piece. I think that's going to be key to acceleration. And when I say innovation, I don't necessarily mean reinventing the wheel. I think we've seen a lot of indigenous ways of managing water come to the foreground that are still innovative, but it's old technologies that are kind of being brought back. But I think the piece that's really been missing from this narrative is really how do we do all of this in a way that's inclusive and equitable? Because at the end of the day, everything that we're doing is for the people. Um, so we really want to keep that at the center of the acceleration. So acceleration for what cause? Um, are we doing it just for the sake of going fast or are we doing it for the sake of going together? Yeah. Um, so that really, I think, is central for cities in terms of accelerating action for water. May Abu Talib, your thoughts on this, our closing thoughts, because we've got lots more to talk about. We have to start wrapping up. We can only win. Um if we work together, I mean, that's the that's, that's the solution for for all things that we can we can do. Well, we mayors and local governments have a, a limited tools, um, um, and and we have to work with uh, the public institutions, with the market, with federal governments. In my case, also with European institutions, which are really, uh, really really important. To give a, an, an example, I, I lead a commission on a request of the Dutch government to deal with uh, water safety in Rotterdam, the region, region of Rijnmond, and another region called Drechtsteer, and that's about two million people. Um, because we have a lot of water, and that water is a big danger. And we have to study last 10 years what type of solutions are important. And we do that together with water boards, with, uh, with uh, um, uh, commercial institutions, with the Port of Rotterdam, and I have the honor to chair the commission. And we have to take tough decisions whether we will give the river more space. That means we exclude a big portion of land um, from construction work and whatever, or we have to raise the level of dikes in the urban area. Um, both solutions are, are complicated, but in terms of legislation and financing and who is going to do what, a very difficult and uh, difficult thing. I said well, you cannot solve a crisis within the limited existing laws. So one of my advices to the Dutch government was, we have water boards, we pay taxes for water boards. It's about $500 a year per household. What if we double that um, uh, tax. tax for the water boards, so from 500 to 1,000, and instead, um, in reverse for that, in return for that, we reduce the income tax with 0.1% um, to make it um, neutral for the citizens, but the institutions that deal with water will have more budgets. Mm -hmm. And we make that type of budget more political neutral uh, without intervention of government and parliament. Um, seeking for other type of legislation, otherwise financing. And um, um, the parliament said, uh, Mr. Abu Talib, and I said, yeah, but we have to, really, to think more about that. So it's, it's uh, still, still in the, in, <laughs> still in the, but it's still in the kitchen. Okay. Uh, so we, we make a, a something to eat out of it. And I think it's really important that you do that together, uh, to rethink things together. And there is not a solution that a city can reach in its own. On its own. Mayor Gallego, your final thoughts uh, on this fascinating conversation. Um, what is your hope, ask? from this conference uh, and, and, and going forward? We want people who are all over the world to look at cities, including C40 cities, for potential partnerships. We know that by 2025, two thirds of the world could live in water stressed areas. This has to be a top challenge. Uh, for us as desert communities, we have been working on this for long term and we very much want to be at the table. This is not something that national governments can solve alone. So we hope that as the world looks at these terribly difficult water issues that they'll remember that the cities need to be at the table and that success stories from cities need to be highlighted and spread at scale. HP? Thank you. It's very clear this crisis, uh, if we are all want it to be solved, requires a holistic thinking, but a completely new way of thinking from policy to financing, to technology, to collaboration, to implementation on the ground. And the only way to do that is to acknowledge we have to do things differently. Doing it the same old way and expecting a different <coughs> outcome is not going to make us a smarter society. So doing things differently and expecting with a sense of optimism, we can solve it in our lifetime. Rebecca. Closing statement. Yes, please. <laughs> I think I'll keep it very simple. 
I think we've really noticed that cities are doers and not delayers. And that's really what we need. We need people that are going to do more versus continuing to speak about things and delaying. Wonderful. Thank you all so Thank very you. much. That was a really, for me, eye-opening you know, conversation. I've learned so much uh, about the possibilities if we have the will, right? And that we need to work locally and to work with what we have and that uh, cooperation is vital. And so we need to think, as you put so succinctly, uh, think differently and together to make progress. So thank you all thank you. Thank you. so very much very for much. this uh, conversation. Uh, we will be back at uh, 11.30 uh, a.m. Eastern Time, New York Time, where we will be talking about the need to act together. We'll be focusing on a new report from the Global Commission on the Economics of Water. I do hope you'll join us then. For now, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.